It was a dark, moonless night in the small Serbian town of Svetsdara. My co-worker Anna and I were walking home after a long day and decided to take the shortcut through the alleyway of the cathedral. We hummed a tune to pass the time. The only sound accompanying us was the soft shuffling of leaves under our feet. The streets were empty, except for a few stray cats darting around in the shadows. I bent down and fed them half my sandwich from lunch. As we neared the end of the street, a chill ran down my spine. The cats started hissing and yowling in terror, then ran past us. It was then that we saw her, a woman dancing straight ahead. She was standing on the other side of the street, illuminated only by the flickering light of a nearby street lamp. At first, I thought she was a street performer, dressed in traditional Serbian clothing with a long flowing skirt that swayed with her every movement. But as we got closer, I noticed that something was off. Her movements were unnatural, jerky, and exaggerated. Her face was expressionless, her eyes vacant. We turned around and quickened our pace, wanting to put some distance between us. But the dancing lady followed, her movements becoming more frenzied. So we ran. We tried to lose her, but she was right behind us. And Anna tripped and fell. I couldn't stop running. I looked back. Her long fingers reached out and grabbed Anna by the shoulder, her nails digging into her flesh. She struggled to break free, but the dancing woman was too strong. I screamed in anger, cursing the stranger and ran over to free Anna. The strange woman smiled from ear to ear and released her. She immediately grabbed me. Her grip tightened, and I could feel her hot breath on the back of my neck. She whispered something in a language I didn't understand. But even if I had, I don't think I would have been able to comprehend the madness in her voice. She pushed me to the ground. As she danced around me, I felt a sense of overwhelming dread. I sat there frozen in terror. The woman continued to dance, moving with a grace and fluidity that seemed supernatural. Her movements were wild and her face was contorted into a grotesque grin. I tried not to fixate on her and looked around for an escape. Then she pulled out a knife and I knew that I was in the presence of something evil, something beyond my comprehension. The dancing lady seemed to be in a trance, lost in a world of her own, but she wasn't alone. Suddenly, I heard a scream coming from behind me. I turned to see Anna being dragged away by two figures dressed in black. They were faceless, featureless shadows, their movements silent and swift. I tried to run after them, but the dancing lady held me back with a strength that defied her small figure. Anna's screams echoed through the empty streets, growing fainter and fainter until they faded away completely. I was left alone with the dancing lady, her movements growing more frenzied by the second. I knew that if I didn't get away soon, I would suffer the same fate as my friend. With a burst of adrenaline, I managed to break free and run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. I didn't look back until I had reached the safety of my own apartment building. And when I did, I could have sworn I saw the woman floating in the air in the distance. As I fumbled with my keys, I could feel the dancing lady's eyes boring into the back of my head. But when I took one last look as I closed the door, she was gone. I bolted it shut and ran inside, and panicked as I called Anna's cell phone. There was no response. I called a few more times and each call went straight to voicemail. A thousand thoughts were running through my head. Maybe she was able to fight them off and run away, but dropped her phone in the process. Perhaps she was already safe at home and passed out in exhaustion. Or maybe she isn't picking up because she can't. Then Anna finally called me back, and I sighed in relief. But when I answered the phone, hello, Anna? all I heard was the sound of heavy breathing and then the foreign language. I felt dread in the pit of my stomach. So I hung up on whoever that was and immediately called the police. 
They told me they'd be at my place in five minutes. I sat on my couch, shaking and counting down the seconds until I would be protected. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I looked over at my balcony door, and there she was, the dancing lady, holding Anna's head in one hand and her bloody knife with the other. I nearly fainted. She just kept dancing while scratching the glass door with her knife. Her moves were more erratic. As I watched her move from side to side, I was hypnotized. Despite my fear, I couldn't look away. It was as if I was under her spell, entranced by her dance. I slowly got up, walked over, slid the door open, and let her in, and had lost control of my body. We started dancing together. Our eyes were locked on one another. The dancing lady was unlike anything I had ever encountered before. Her movements were eerie and unsettling, and her eyes seemed to pierce through my very soul. And she pulled up her knife to the side of my neck and whispered in her language again. I wanted to scream and punch her, but I couldn't. Then we heard the police sirens, my saving grace. As they ran up the stairs and started banging on my door, the dancing lady kissed me farewell on the cheek, then jumped out the balcony into the night. I stared into the darkness. The only sound was the pounding of my heart. And then I fainted. The next morning, I woke up in the hospital. I sat up in bed, sweating and shaking. I sat there, lost in my thoughts as the doctor took a few tests and discharged me. I asked about Anna and the dancing lady, and they looked at me confused and checked my head once more. As I left, I called Anna's family. I didn't know how to explain what had happened to their daughter. But as we talked, I realized something strange. Anna's family didn't seem to remember who she was. It was as if she had never existed. I tried to brush it off as a bizarre coincidence, but the more I thought about it, the more it troubled me. And then I remembered the strange language the dancing lady had spoken to me. So I scoured the internet and spoke to locals for any clues that could shed light on the mysterious woman. It turned out that the dancing lady was a demon, a powerful entity capable of possessing those it encountered, forcing them to dance until they died of exhaustion or were consumed by madness. The faceless shadows that took Anna were her minions. I knew I had to do something, so I started to learn everything I could about her, her weaknesses. I prepared myself for the inevitable showdown. I went to the cathedral where I first encountered the dancing lady and waited. It was a dark, moonless night, much like the one when I first encountered her. But this time, I was armed with my knowledge. She appeared out of thin air. I stood my ground and faced the demon head on. The battle was fierce, and at times it seemed as though the dancing lady had the upper hand. But I refused to give in, drawing on all my strength. And then, in a final burst of energy, I struck her with a powerful blow, sending her reeling backward. For a moment, there was silence, and I thought that I had won. But then, with a roar, she lunged forward, her body twisting and contorting in an unnatural dance. I braced myself for the worst, ready to face whatever the demon had in store and remember that demons could be weakened with the power of faith. And so, I began to recite the prayers my grandmother had taught me as a child. As I prayed, her movements became more sluggish. And then, in a blinding flash of light, she was gone, leaving me standing alone in the darkness. The memory of that night still haunts me to this day. I don't know what the dancing lady wanted from me, I learned that there are things in this world that defy explanation, forcing us to confront the limits of our own sanity. In the end, there was no escaping the Serbian dancing lady. She had claimed me as her own, and I was doomed to be her eternal dance partner.
Have you ever felt like you had two stomachs? One for savory foods and one for sweets? And that no matter how much you ate, you could never be full? Well, that's how my daughter felt for most of her life. Except one was for regular meals, and one was for fresh meat. It wasn't until she finally gave in to her cravings that she finally felt satisfied. Mai and I lived in Tano, a city in Japan known for its beautiful scenery, historical sites, and mysterious beings. We are natives, while my daughter's husband is an American social media influencer who moved to Japan. Even after my daughter got married, I stayed with her because of a very unique condition that kept her hidden even from her own husband. It's a family secret. Our family was cursed for ages. Every few generations, one female in the family became the Furukuchi Ona and had an additional mouth on the back of her head. Mother, I'm hungry again, but I'm worried I'll put on more weight, Mai said. Mai was staring at herself in the mirror, her long black hair obscuring her face. She took a deep breath and slowly lifted her hair, revealing the second mouth on the back of her head. The mouth was small, but its teeth were sharp and its lips plump, ready to devour food that came its way. She fed it a carrot, but it spit it out in disgust. Why did it have to be my daughter? I hated her condition, hated the way it made her feel like a monster ever since she was young. I would have to wear thick gloves when I brushed her hair, or else it would bite me. Mai had learned to keep it hidden, to suppress her insatiable hunger, which had gotten worse recently. When she was younger, she would just eat twice as much, but now all she craves is meat. Mai was trying to distract herself. She picked up her phone and started scrolling through Instagram, but as she looked through pictures, Mai couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy. She saw images of meat dishes, succulent and juicy, and she longed to taste them. But she knew she couldn't, not with Henry around. Henry was her husband, a fitness influencer who was obsessed with maintaining a perfect, healthy lifestyle. He was constantly preaching the benefits of a plant-based diet and had pressured Mai into becoming a vegan too. But Mai struggled to maintain the diet. My daughter was raised consuming local meat and seafood. So having a controlling husband who only ate a plant-based diet was a struggle not only for her, but also for me since I couldn't cook and enjoy our favorite dishes. Mai sighed and put down her phone. I could tell she felt trapped in her marriage, trapped by her condition and Henry's controlling behavior. But she knew she had to keep her secret hidden. The pandemic had made everything worse. Mai was stuck in her apartment, unable to go out and distract herself from her hunger. Mai took a deep breath and tried to focus on something else. She opened her laptop and scrolled past Henry's latest post. A picture of him holding a vegan smoothie. Mai rolled her eyes and clicked away. She knew she couldn't keep living like this. She tried her best to keep up with Henry's lifestyle, but it was taking a toll on her both physically and mentally. She constantly felt weak and tired, and her second mouth's hunger for meat was growing stronger by the day. But Henry didn't care. He was convinced that his way of life was the only way, and he would criticize Mai for any slip-ups. He would call her names, make her feel guilty, and even refuse to eat with her if she didn't comply with his strict rules. But the abuse only got worse. Henry would make comments about Mai's weight, would restrict her meals, and would even withhold affection if he didn't get what he wanted. Mai felt like she was walking on eggshells, constantly trying to please him and avoid his wrath. As Henry continued to insult her, Mai felt her rage growing hotter and hotter. And then one day, Mai told me that from the back of her head came a sinister voice urging her to take action. Mai could feel the sharp teeth of her demonic second mouth gnashing in anticipation, urging her to unleash the fury that had been building inside of her for so long. What does the voice say, Mai? I asked my daughter. Kill him. Mai shuddered with a mixture of fear and excitement. He deserves it. Make him pay for everything he's done to you. I gasped at what I heard. Mai cried and hid her face from me. My heart sank. 
Mai claimed she tried to block out the voice, to bury it deep inside her. But the more Henry spoke, the more insistent the voice became. It was as if her demonic second mouth had a mind of its own. Mai felt helpless. I suggested she leave her husband, but she immediately rejected that idea. The pandemic only made things worse. Henry was stuck at home with Mai and he would take out his frustration on her. He would yell at her for small things and make her clean the apartment for hours on end, while keeping tabs on what she ate. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to confront my son-in-law for fear that I might be driven away from their house and could no longer help my daughter from the demon on the back of her head. Mai knew she had to find a way out. As her back mouth's hunger for meat grew more substantial, I helped Mai take small bites here and there, trying to satisfy her cravings without Henry noticing. Having a neighbor purchase and deliver meat to us while Henry was asleep. But it was only a matter of time before Henry found out. And when he did, he was furious. He called her a liar, a cheat, and a monster. He said he couldn't believe he had married someone like her, and that he didn't even want to look at her anymore. Mai confessed to me that she felt a surge of anger and desperation. She had to do something, anything, to escape Henry's abuse and control. The angrier he made her, the hungrier she got. The only thing that brought her any sense of relief was the thought of satisfying her hunger. Whenever Henry was filming a video in his studio, I let my daughter eat the meat that the neighbor dropped off. That was the only time I saw Mai calm down. However, it became a major issue when I ran out of money and couldn't get any more for her. Mai's back mouth was like a cruel demon, constantly tormenting her and pressuring her. It drove her to insanity. She was no longer in control of her thoughts or actions, as the demonic voice in her head had taken over. It was as if she was possessed, a vessel for the dark desires of her back mouth. She was constantly fighting with her husband, and they were now sleeping in separate beds, completely avoiding each other. She turned into a monster. Her second mouth only grew larger until it could no longer be hidden by her hair. At this point, I was terrified. I couldn't go near my daughter. Honestly, I was afraid for my life. One morning, my daughter's husband became irritated when he saw that the refrigerator was empty. The Furakuchi Ona took over my daughter in the middle of the night and consumed all the food in the fridge. He was pacing back and forth in the kitchen, his face contorted in a mix of anger and frustration. Where is it? His voice echoing off the walls. Who the hell ate all the food? He started blaming my daughter, but I quickly came to her aid. I ate the food. I'm sorry. His fists clenched even tighter, and he let out a low guttural growl. He looked like he was about to explode with rage. Get out of my house! He shouted at me and punched the fridge. I was so shocked at his reaction and the disrespect. I went to my room to pack my belongings. As I was packing my things, I heard a commotion in the house. When I checked what it was, I saw my daughter arguing with her husband. She was enraged when she found out that her husband told her mother to get out of the house. My son-in-law was adamant and didn't give in to Mai's pleas that he reconsider. Mai was furious. I went back to my room to continue packing my things when I heard a commotion. I heard Henry scream in terror. I rushed to the kitchen and was shocked by what I saw. Henry's body was oozing out blood. The Fudakuchiona had completely taken control of my daughter. Her body contorted. Her skin became pale white with specks of crimson blood, and her raven black hair formed strands of thick hair-like tentacles that stretched out and fed her even larger mouth on the back of her head. One of Henry's arms dropped and rolled to the floor near me. I initially thought of running away and asking for help, but Mai is still my daughter. I also felt Henry deserved his terrible death. I picked up the arm and offered it to the Fudakuchiona, who got up and ran backwards to get her treat. She licked her lips and devoured his arm, smiling with satisfaction. I promised her that I would do my best to feed her whatever she wanted, 
and thanked her. She saved my daughter from the abuse of her brutal husband and freed her. <laughs> As the cable car snapped and shot down Mount Sao, the group of friends screamed in terror and regretted their vacation choice. The last thing they saw before the crash were the icy blue eyes of the stranger, staring into their souls and opening her mouth to blow a gust of cool air towards them. Yumi, Aruka, Taro, and Satoshi decided to vacation at a remote ski resort in Mount Sao. Infamous for its snow monsters, trees that are covered in white snow, giving them the appearance of winter creatures. A rare spectral delight that occurs thanks to a combination of snowfall, humidity, and wind. The girls weren't fond of this weather. Yumi wanted to go south and soak up some much needed vitamin D, but joined because of her best friend Haruka. When they arrived in the lobby, the resort appeared to be deserted. They were staying in a large wooden cabin, but didn't see any other guests. Maybe everyone left before the snowstorm. Haruka dropped her bags and walked towards Yumi with a worried expression. She was starting to regret her decision as well. She only came on this trip to paint the snow-covered trees and monsters. Finally, a woman checked them in. She gave them the keys along with a pamphlet with all the activities the resort had to offer. The group of friends headed to their room, unpacked, and spent some time in front of the fireplace. Their teeth chattered from the frigid cold. Taro quickly inspected the cabin, deemed it safe, and suggested they enjoy the amenities, like the jacuzzi. Satoshi, who was always looking for thrills, stayed outside scanning the area for a spot to explore. Taro joined him, and the two guys examined the snow monsters in the distance, enjoying a cigarette. They entered the cabin, and Taro's expression showed that he too was feeling uneasy. They called it an early night after all that traveling. The next morning, the four friends decided to go for an adventure. They rode in a cable car to get around the mountains and sightsee before they hit the slopes. Aruka and Satoshi took photos. Yumi admired the small snowflakes falling from the sky and watched it get heavier. They were having a good time when Taro suddenly froze. He noticed something staring at them from afar. They were not alone. Below them, a beautiful woman stepped out from the shadows of the trees. They all stared at her in awe. Then her face twisted into a terrifying expression, her mouth wide open, and she let out a piercing screech. She looked at them with cold, lifeless eyes, and her gaze penetrated the very core of their being. Her long black hair stood out against the stark white snow, and her presence was accompanied by a gust of cold wind that made their skin crawl. They were paralyzed with fear as she seemed to float above the snow, leaving no footprints behind. Her eyes were locked on them as she hovered closer. They didn't know what to do, but luckily the cable car passed her. As they neared the end of their ride, the snow worsened, making it difficult for them to see. Suddenly, the cable car stopped. The blizzard was getting worse. They were stranded and knew they had to act fast if they wanted to survive. Aruka screamed in terror and everyone turned around. Not far away from them was the tall woman. As they got closer, they noticed that she was incredibly thin and lanky. She blended in with the trees. She wore a white kimono and despite her beauty, her eyes struck terror. She appeared to be examining them, then fixated on Taro. She slowly grinned from ear to ear and watched as the cable car started to move again. Then she vanished. The cable car went ten times faster, moving at the speed of light. The friends held on to whatever they could, screaming and praying, hoping this nightmare would end. But then, the cable car snapped. The last thing they saw before the crash were the icy blue eyes of the stranger, staring into their souls and opening her mouth to blow a gust of cool air towards them. They were thrown out of the car, but luckily only fell several feet down 
and landed in a pile of fresh snow. They felt an overwhelming sense of sleepiness as they laid there struggling to get up. They thought it was the adrenaline rush wearing off or maybe it was hypothermia. They tried to fight it but fell asleep. Yumi woke up first and was met with an ice-cold breeze. She realized something was wrong and shook Taro and Haruka awake. Satoshi was missing. Yumi, Taro, and Haruka searched for him, and what they found was too gruesome. Satoshi's body was covered in ice. His body was drained of blood. His eyes were open and had a look of terror frozen on his face. The three friends were horrified and couldn't believe it. They were scared for their lives, knowing that Satoshi did not die a natural death. They huddled together for body heat. They tried to come to terms with the reality that one of them was now dead. The mood was tense as they sat there in silence, until Taro spoke up. I think it's the Yukiona. His voice was low, and filled with dread. I've heard the legends before, and all the signs point to her. The snowstorm, the icy breath, the drained blood, it all fits. Yumi and Haruka looked at each other realizing that he was right. Yukiona is a ghostly spirit associated with snowstorms and known for her icy breath and vampire tendencies. They all heard the legends before, but never thought they could be true. They knew they had to face reality and find a way to survive. They had to stick together and stay alert. Their only option was to navigate the snowstorm on foot. They still had the pamphlet from the resort, which included a map. As they soldiered through the snowstorm, they were all on high alert, their hearts pounding with fear. And suddenly, the Yuki Oni ambushed them, her ghostly figure blending in with the snow-covered trees. Aruka and Taro were quick to act. Aruka pushed Yumi behind her, shielding her with her body. She used a tree branch as a weapon. Taro immediately used his expertise in outdoor survival. He started a small fire using his lighter and some branches he had gathered for distraction. They all worked together, Aruka using her strength to fend off Yukiona's attacks while Taro used his fire to keep her at bay. Yumi attacked the monster from behind. They all fought bravely, but unfortunately, Yukiona was too strong for them. Aruka was killed by a blast of freezing air from Yukiona's breath, turning into a frost-coated corpse. Yumi was killed by an icicle that she had conjured from the snow. Taro was the last brave soul. His only goal was to survive. He stumbled and fell back, his body weak and in pain. He could feel her icy breath on his face and knew it was over but refused to give up. He used his remaining energy to push himself up and ran, his heart racing faster than his feet. He didn't look back. His mind focused on survival, but he tripped and fell. Yukiona caught up to him, floating gracefully. The creature looked down on Taro, whose tears were turned into little gems of ice. He was ready for his turn. But she smiled and placed her hand on his cheek. Suddenly, she spoke softly. I thought I was going to kill you, the same as all your friends, but I will not because you are young and handsome. You must not tell anyone about this incident. If you tell anyone about me, I will have no other choice but to kill you. Then she stepped away and slowly melted, and Taro fainted. Taro sat in his jail cell replaying the recent events over and over again. Haruka, Yumi, and Satoshi's deaths haunted him, and he couldn't shake off the feeling of guilt for being the only survivor. <laughs> the doctors told him he was lucky to be alive, but he didn't feel lucky. He felt alone, in a constant state of fear. His friends' bodies were found and brought back home, and they were given a proper burial. He wasn't invited. Everyone blamed Taro and knew he was hiding something. But since there was no proof, they were going to release him. 
What aided him the most was not being able to tell the whole truth, of Yuki Ona being the cause of their tragic deaths. How she froze them. He made a promise with a beautiful demon and had no intention of breaking it anytime soon. Those who knew Zella in person would agree on a couple of things. She was warm, nurturing, and too good for her own good. What was supposed to be the start of a lifetime together ended too soon in tragedy and blood. The newlyweds Zella and Dave were enjoying the last week of their honeymoon. They had been traveling all month long across Southeast Asia, from Barakai in the Philippines to Phuket in Thailand. They were a power couple, balancing each other perfectly. While Dave was more stern, book smart, and analytical, Zella was more of a free spirit, witty and friendly. The couple was staying at a small resort near the ocean. After breakfast that one morning, Dave went to town to find an extra suitcase for souvenirs, while Zella decided to go for a quick swim and sunbathe. While at the beach, Zella noticed something had washed ashore. She ran to check on it once she realized it was a girl. The girl wasn't breathing, so Zella performed CPR on her and was relieved when she gained consciousness. The young girl was exhausted and covered in feces. She quickly rinsed her with seawater and brought her a sandwich. The girl didn't accept it at first, but eventually took the bread and smelled it. When she noticed there was a piece of grilled pork, she devoured it. While the resort staff weren't looking, Zella snuck the girl into their suite and helped her clean up. She dressed her in one of her shirts and shorts. The girl didn't say a word but smiled. She was really pretty. When Zella asked if she had family, the little girl just shook her head no and frowned. Zella decided to call her Sarai for now, which means seaweed in Thai, and told her everything would be okay. Soon there was a knock on the door. Dave had returned. Zella met her husband outside the room and was so excited to tell him about her day, but warned him not to freak out. She quickly explained the situation and who she found on the beach. She opened the door to introduce him to Sarai. Sarai just stared at Dave with zero facial expression. Then she rubbed her stomach as it started to growl. Dave brought back some lunch and gave it to the girl who devoured it quickly. After their meal, Zella fell asleep on the couch while Sarai hugged her. Dave was surprised to see Sarai's head resting on her belly like a daughter embracing her mother. When Zella woke up, she pleaded with him to let the girl stay with them and said that she felt a special bond with her, that this could be good practice for them as they wanted to start a family soon. Dave saw Sarai watching them from the corner of the room. She seemed sweet and innocent. He was convinced and agreed to let her stay with them until they could gather more information on her and her family. He had some hesitations, but didn't want to spoil their last week of vacation. That night, Dave overheard loud noises coming from outside their window. It sounded like someone was trying to break in. Zella and Dave went to the living room to check on Sarai, but the girl was gone. As they searched the suite for intruders and looked for their missing guest, Dave instructed his wife to lock herself in the bedroom. Zella was worried about Sarai, but it was almost midnight. She felt some discomfort in her stomach and agreed to go to bed. Dave felt some suspicion, but didn't want to upset his wife, so he locked their room and laid in bed beside her. He wasn't able to sleep that night as he thought about how Zella found the girl on the beach. He promised himself that he would take care of his wife. He started dozing off and closed his eyes. Then, he heard a high-pitched noise and swooshing sounds coming from outside. Dave left the suite to investigate the cause of it. When he approached a cluster of banana trees, he saw a head floating in the air. Underneath, his wife was covered in blood. Her belly was ripped open. Dave screamed, and his wife woke him up. It was only a nightmare. Dave looked at her belly and cuddled her. They heard the sound of roosters, indicating it was already morning. But that was accompanied by wailing. They ran outside and found a woman crying. She found her three-year-old son dead and half-eaten in his room. It seemed that the boy was devoured by a dangerous animal who feasted on his internal organs. 
The news spread so fast that policemen surrounded the area. Dave told Zella to be careful, but she was still worried about Sarai and wondered where she went. The next day, Zella was back to her normal, happy self. She wanted to prepare a home-cooked meal. She also wanted to have a serious talk with her husband. So they headed to the market to find ingredients to make a curry. After purchasing a few items, they found the girl wandering around eating garbage. Her shirt was covered in dirt and meat juice. Zella ran to her and asked where she went last night. They embraced and she guided her back to the resort. Dave wanted to protest, but saw how much his wife loved Sarai. He looked at the little girl and she smiled at him. The smile captured his heart, but he still had some doubts. That night, Dave volunteered to join the neighborhood watch to help find the culprit that killed the woman's son. He was only gone for an hour and Zella was having a movie night with Sarai. They roamed around town, but didn't hear or see anything out of the ordinary. So they decided to go back home. Then, Dave heard the same high-pitched sound and swooshing from outside their suite. It was followed by thudding sounds and glass shattering. He opened the door, went to their bedroom, and was shocked by what he saw. Zella's belly was ripped open and she was dead, and the window was broken. Next to her on the bed was a pregnancy test. It said positive. Dave cried out while embracing his wife. Then he stood up and looked for Sarai, but the girl was again missing. He was sure at that point that she was the monster responsible for the recent deaths. When Dave left the resort, he was shocked to see that several local animals had been discovered dead. A few guests and locals were explaining to the policemen what they had encountered. A krasu. They saw a little girl's glowing head floating in the air, with her bloody intestines hanging down from her neck, trailing below her head. She had pointed fangs exposed while eating red meat. They decided to unite in making tools like bamboo spears and gathered machetes. Some even brought rifles to catch the creature. The whole town was now in a frenzy, trying to find the local girl who they suspected of committing these heinous crimes. A group of them went to the forest and built enormous traps. They were confident that they would catch the monster. Now they just had to wait and stay vigilant. As they walked to the resort, the entire village was sobbing loudly. The Krasu had slaughtered every pregnant woman, leaving their bellies exposed. Their unborn babies were consumed. One thing was clear to those who saw them die. A girl's floating head did it. They roamed around town with torches, knives, spears, and rifles as their weapons. When they headed for the forest again and heard the same high-pitched and swooshing noise coming from a cluster of banana trees. They were similar to the ones from Dave's nightmare. And when he looked closer, he saw the headless body of the Krasu wearing his wife's shirt stained with dirt and blood. He was full of so much rage at that point, he stabbed the headless body first. Everyone followed his lead and pierced the Krasu with bamboo spears and knives and burned it with their torches. As they did this, they heard the creature's high-pitched cries in the sky and then the sound of flames. Their mourning turned into cheers of celebration. They killed the Krasu. The night before Dave's flight back to America, they held a funeral for all the victims. The sheriff shook his head and hugged Dave. He said his condolences. He recalled a similar occurrence from his youth. He explained that a famished lady had arrived in his town and asked for food. There was a famine and everyone was poor as a result of a series of strong typhoons that destroyed livestock and farmlands. He said everyone was hungry and had no food, so no one could help the woman. Before leaving, the woman cursed the town, but she made a mistake or used the wrong spell, and her head and body were separated. She was forever hungry and always active at night, hunting to satisfy her gluttony, searching for blood to drink or raw flesh to devour, and leaving a trail of corpses behind. Several of his loved ones became victims. He also said that a person will become a krasu after having food or drink contaminated with its saliva. While Dave placed his hand on his wife's casket and mourned, 
He thought about the future they could have had together. He said his prayers before Zella's casket was carried away to be put on a plane. But suddenly, the wooden casket started shaking. For a moment, Dave was excited. Maybe his wife was still alive. He opened the box. And immediately, Zella's head flew up into the air with bloodthirsty eyes and looked for her next victim. Mang Ido was a hunter who frequented the Palawan rainforests. That night wasn't so different from the others he spent stalking wild pigs. Except this time he crossed a forbidden area elders cautioned every kid not to venture into. But he wasn't a kid anymore. And besides, since most of the other hunters avoided the area, it was most certainly crawling with animals to catch. He was slowly going down a trail when he heard a tree branch snap. He stopped and held his breath. He scanned the area for creatures heavy enough to snap a branch, but nothing. He resumed walking, cautiously looking above the trees when he heard another tree branch break on his right. Just like before, he stopped and observed. That's when he saw smoke coming from the top of a large acacia tree. Mang Ido was horrified to see a giant creature towering over him, smoking a cigar. He fell as he tried to leave the area. The creature on top of the large tree laughed. It was as if he was playing with Mang Ido and enjoying his distress. Mang Ido ran as fast as he could because he heard of this creature before. The tree dwellers of the Philippines, called the Capre. <laughs> they are one of the spirits ancestors warned them about. Mang Ido kept running. And he was found dead that morning by men hunting around the area. He died of exhaustion based on the autopsy report. He kept running in circles until his heart failed. My name is Rika. I'm 30 years old now, still single and constantly pestered with questions as to why. My family has lived near the forest for centuries. But now I need to leave because of the deep sorrow I've been feeling since losing the two men who loved me. The first one was Harold, my childhood friend. We were classmates from elementary to high school. He taught me how to surf and later revealed his true intentions of wanting to marry me. Which I refused because I was attracted to another man. The other one was a capre. Very tall, dark and handsome. Just the way I like them. His scent of tobacco and musk is what drew me in. My life has been full of sorrow, starting from when my parents separated and abandoned me with my grandparents when I was a baby. Perhaps it was the major reason I was wary about falling in love and getting too close to Harold. He courted me for years, but I didn't feel any excitement with him. I also didn't find him attractive. I remember one time when we were surfing. Tourists were harassing us. Harold never attempted to protect me. Instead, he left me and ran away. From then on, I considered him a coward. But my worst sorrow happened when my grandparents were murdered by two drunk men. They went to our house and asked for money to buy more liquor. They were both unarmed, but when my grandfather tried to scare them using his jungle bolo, they were able to take it from him and then struck him in the head. Blood splattered everywhere. He fell to the ground as my grandmother faced the men and begged them to leave. The man holding the bolo also hit my grandmother in the head. They were about to leave when one of them was thrown against a tree and pinned there with a small tree branch. His chest was nailed to it as he cried in pain and tried to move his hands and feet until he could no longer breathe. The man holding the bolo cried in fear. 
Capre! He attempted to defend himself by swinging the bolo in every direction. Then a huge hairy figure jumped down, grabbed his arm, and broke it. He slammed the man to the ground repeatedly until his body was smashed. I felt good when I saw the man who killed my grandparents being tortured by the gigantic being. Honestly, I didn't feel scared of him and even felt protected. Now that my grandparents were gone, I needed someone like him by my side. After both my grandparents were laid to rest, I felt lonely. Harold visited me on occasion, but his presence didn't make me feel any better. I longed for the giant tree man. One night, I woke up and was shocked to find myself on top of a huge tree. I almost panicked, but the sight of the stars and the moon calmed me down. I smelled tobacco smoke and saw the eight-foot man sitting on a tree branch. The leaves of the trees were rustling even though there was no wind. He had long, coarse black hair, a beard, and big, fiery eyes. He handed me some fruits, bananas, mangoes, and papayas. When I peeled and ate the mango, he smiled. It was the juiciest and sweetest fruit I'd ever eaten. Since then, the creature visited me every night and gave me fruits to eat. He also offered me a beautiful necklace with a tiny white stone. Harold came to see me one night and discovered my secret when the capre dropped me off. He chose to destroy the tree where my friend was living and chopped it down with an axe. I wasn't able to stop him because I was at the market. When I returned, the tree was already chopped down. I hated Harold for what he did, but he confessed that he did it because he loved me. I never talked to him again. Harold returned one night drunk. He was depressed because of what had happened between us. I told him that I didn't want to see him anymore. He yelled at me, stating that he was willing to die for me and fight the capre. The tree leaves started rustling, and I smelt tobacco. My heart jumped because I knew that the capre came to punish Harold for cutting down the tree. For the first time, Harold wasn't a coward. Maybe he realized that this night was his final shot at winning my love. He suddenly brought out a jungle bolo similar to that of my grandfather's. Come on! Harold looked around as he shouted. I am here! Fight! It ends tonight. One has to die. He slashed his bolo around the air. Show your- Harold was not yet finished with his sentence when he was thrown against a tree. The capre slowly revealed himself. Standing in the center of our front yard was a bulky, big creature. His skin was emitting a sulfur-like scent. His eyes were red. The creature was furious and threw his oversized cigar at Harold. Harold fell to the ground. He cried from the sharp pain but ignored it and looked for his bolo. His right hand grabbed the weapon on the ground and raised it above his head. Harold was determined to kill the capre. He lunged forward as he slashed his sword in the air. The capre grabbed Harold's hand and tore it off. Harold cried in pain and was shook. He was about to shout when the capre finished him off by twisting his head and severing it from his neck. The events were so quick that I wasn't able to interfere. The capre sighed and lit up his cigar. I felt pity for Harold, whose death was because of me. I cried because I lost my childhood friend. The capre walked over, took one last look at Harold, and blew smoke onto his body, burning it into ashes. The capre then looked at me and asked me to come with him to his domain. I knew that this was a one-way trip. Once I left with him, I could never come back. Because of this, I refused and told him I needed space. The capre left me all alone with what remained of my friend. Years later, I have forgiven the capre for what he did to Harold and always wait for his return. 
but he never did. I'm now sure that I'm willing to go with him and leave this world forever. There was no one and nothing left for me here. While laying in bed, I held the stone on the necklace he gave me extra tight, wishing for the capre to appear one last time. Slowly, I smelled the familiar scent of tobacco. Then I heard the deep laughter that was music to my ears. <laughs> I opened my eyes and ran to the window. The capre was waiting for me outside.